Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk about heavy fighters. While today the concept isn't much of a thing in that we don't designate fighters in this way anymore, back before the Second World War, the concept of and creation of heavy fighter designs was picking up steam for most major powers. As aircraft technology was rapidly evolving, the idea behind heavy fighter designs was to make these massive, often multi-engine fighter aircraft, with bigger weapons, greater range, and higher speeds. In a vacuum, these planes were kind of incredible, offering just about everything you would want in a fighter aircraft. In the lead-up to World War II and during the war, all major powers designed, tested, and or fielded heavy fighters, often to results not nearly as promising as initially expected. The major issue surrounding any and all heavy fighters was their size. They were often just too bulky and lacked the agility necessary for aerial combat against smaller single-engine fighters. It didn't matter how big the guns were, how good the range was, how thick the armor was, in aerial combat you need agility. As a result, a great many heavy fighter designs were often adapted to roles more suitable for their size and comparative lack of agility. They would often see use as night fighters, largely because their inherent size made it easy to add and install radar technology and whatever else was needed for nighttime conditions. They would also be used more in traditional bomber roles, along with other roles that required basically no agility, like torpedo bombing and ground attacking. In this sense, heavy fighters of the era became less fighters but more multi-role aircraft. Now, of all World War II major powers, there was probably no other country more enamored with the heavy fighter concept than Germany. While most other countries were looking into the concept quite a bit, Britain in particular, although they were closer to the multi-role concept, but I digress, Germany initially viewed the concept as central to their aerial combat capabilities, much more so than any other nation. For example, before their invasion of Poland in the Luftwaffe, they had 4,200 operational aircraft, with 788 standard fighters, and 431 heavy fighters. 10% of their air forces were heavy fighters. At this time, these were largely Messerschmitt Bf-110s, which at that time were pretty solid. Their size, armament, speed, and range made them solid escort aircraft early in the war, matching up very well against the more inferior elements of the Polish, French, and British air forces. However, once Germany reached Britain proper and began using heavy fighters over Britain, the inherent limitations of the concept became clear. While heavy fighters were envisioned as being faster than single-engine fighters due to the extra engine, the reality was that the single-engine fighters were often both faster and more agile than heavy fighters. Flying over Britain, the BF-110 became victimized by planes like the Supermarine Spitfire. The sheer bulk of the BF-110 was an active hindrance. Still though, despite the inherent limitations of heavy fighters being clear, Germany seemingly remained committed to the concept and embarked on creating several new heavy fighter designs, while also converting bombers to heavy fighter roles. While a great many of these planes would be utilized more in other roles, like night fighters, Germany's commitment to the idea was certainly greater than other major powers. In this commitment, we have our subject for today, a late war attempt to introduce a new and improved heavy fighter, a successful attempt production-wise as over 1,000 of them were made. Could a later war heavy fighter overcome early war inadequacies and be effective against smaller aircraft, or were they doomed to be the Goliath to the smaller fighter's David? This is the Messerschmitt ME-410 Hornet. The story of this plane begins with a familiar face, the BF-110. 
originally introduced back in 1937, before the war and before the Battle of Britain proved disastrous for them, the Germans were already looking into potential replacements for it. You have to plan ahead, after all, stay on the cutting edge. The BF-110 design would evolve into the ME-210 in 1938, and this new heavy fighter design would fly in 1939 the day after the German invasion of Poland. While the BF-110 at this point was still regarded as a well-performing and capable fighter, the ME-210 right out of the gate proved to be an absolute atrocity. While better on paper, faster, better armed, etc., the actual flight performance was abhorrent, and the first model was considered unsafe. It exhibited poor stability, it had a tendency to just stall and spin, and it also had an alarming tendency to just wiggle back and forth in level flight. Now, in a demonstration of terrible judgment before the ME-210 even flew, before they found it to be terrible, the German military ordered 1,000 of them seemingly confident that the 210 would basically just be a better BF-110. Testing and alterations on the 210 soldiered on, and no matter the alterations made, it never seemed to improve. Despite the continuing poor performance, the German government forced the 210 into production in 1941, in an effort to replace the BF-110. The Battle of Britain had already occurred at this point. It seems as though the performance of the 110 in that battle weighed heavily. Still though, the 210's poor performance necessitated yet another attempted improvement in the ME-310, a plane that failed just as quickly as it was made, as that new model fixed absolutely nothing despite desperately trying to. This then led to yet another attempted improvement, the ME-410. Now, on the surface, looking at the 410 and the 210 side by side, I wouldn't blame you if you thought there wasn't a difference here. Looking at this direct side by side, take away all the arrows and writing, you would probably think it was the same plane at a glance. Indeed, the external differences would be rather minor, but apparently incredibly effective. Measuring in at 12.48 meters long, 16.35 meters wide, and 4.28 meters tall, the 410 was ever so slightly larger than the 210 in every measurement, by just fractions of a meter. The more significant alteration came in the wings where the angle of the leading edge was altered. On the 210, there were two different leading edge angles. Divided by the engine nacelles, the inner wing section had a 6 degree angle, and the outer section had a 12.6 degree angle. The 410 would do away with this, and gave both sections a 5.5 degree angle. Other design alterations include a very slight lengthening of the fuselage and the addition of automatic slats on the wings. With these alterations, it was believed that the severe instability issues of the 210 would disappear. Powering the 410 would be two Daimler-Benz DB603 engines, a departure from the DB605 engines used by the 210. These engines would offer greater power than the 605, which in turn gave the 410 greater top speed, increasing from 360 miles an hour for the 210 up to 388 miles an hour for the 410. The greater power also gave the 410 an increased rate of climb and a higher service ceiling which, considering what was happening in Germany late in the war, that was important. Realistically, though, the most important thing would be the improvement in control and stability. The greater performance was a bit of icing on the cake. For its armament, the 410 would have a variety of potential outfits depending on what the situation was and what its role was. For the sort of base model heavy fighter, there would be eight total guns, 
six forward firing and two firing rearward, with three different calibers for some reason. The forward firing guns consisted of four 20mm cannons and two 7.92mm machine guns. Two of these cannons were actually located in the bomb bay. The two rear-facing guns were 13mm machine guns, with one turret on either side of the fuselage. The 410 also had the ability to carry rockets and up to 2,200 pounds of bombs. In some of the other configurations, torpedoes were added for a torpedo bomber role, cameras were added for a reconnaissance role, and a massive 50mm cannon was added for a bomber destroyer role. Keep in mind that the 50mm cannon was the main armament for the Panzer III tank. In that configuration, the 410 was literally a flying tank. But still, all of this would be for nothing if the design alterations didn't fix the stability issues. Luckily for the Luftwaffe, though, those issues were fixed and the 410 handled quite well. After flying for the first time in March 1942, the first 410 models would be delivered in early 1943, and initially they would fill a role that heavy fighters often did, the night fighter role. Here, in most cases going up against enemy night fighters, the 410 proved itself to be quite effective. Going up against British night fighters over England, the 410 proved itself to be a match for the British de Havilland Mosquito. The speed and surprising agility the 410 displayed made it rather difficult for British night fighters to pin them down. For our purposes today, though, I think the real question is how the 410 performed in a more traditional heavy fighter role at this stage of the war going up as intercepting bomber destroyers, taking out planes bombing Germany and German forces. How would the 410 perform here? Would the improvements made make them more effective against Allied aircraft? The answer is... sort of? Question mark? Compared to the BF-110, there was an improvement. Something that I've gone over in another video is America's lack of escort fighters that led them to flying unescorted bomber sorties, hoping that the defensive weaponry of the bombers would be sufficient. Against the BF-110, that actually proved in a good deal of cases to be enough. There would be losses on both sides, to be sure, but BF-110s going up to intercept bomber formations wasn't the slaughter that you would kind of expect. Owing to the greater speed and stronger weaponry, the 410 would be much more successful against unescorted bombers. Not necessarily a powerhouse, but more successful nonetheless. However, the next year, in 1944, Allied bomber formations began appearing more and more frequently with escort fighters, whether they were P-51 Mustangs, Spitfires, or America's quasi-heavy fighter, the P-38 Lightning. For both the BF-110 and the 410, going up against these smaller, more agile fighters was still often a death sentence. In fact, because the 110s and the 410s would prove to be so inadequate against Allied escort fighters, Germany had to give their heavy fighters escorts of their own. The bomber-destroying 110s and 410s would be flanked by BF-109 and FW-190 fighters that would take on Allied escorts while the bomber-destroyers went after the bombers. And yet, despite having escorts of their own, because of the way Allied formations began escorting their bombers, this often didn't matter that much. Instead of the more traditional method of escorting flying alongside their bombers, the escort fighters were permitted to preemptively strike against enemy fighters moving in to intercept. This made it much more difficult for intercepting fighters to reach the attacking bombers and this put the German 110s and 410s at an immediate disadvantage. 
eventually the performance of the 410 and basically any other twin-engine fighter Germany had necessitated their removal from daytime operations. They simply couldn't handle Allied escort fighters, which forced Germany to adapt and use single-engine fighters more frequently in escort and bomber-destroyer roles. The remaining 410s and 110s were often then relegated to either night fighting roles or reconnaissance roles, still serving pretty well in both of them. By the end of the war, 1,189 410s rolled off the production line, which, considering its late introduction into the war and for what ended up being a night fighter slash recon plane, that may have been too much. So, was the 410 able to overcome the issues inherent to heavy fighters and stand up against smaller allied fighters? The answer is clearly no. The massive twin-engine heavy fighters Germany was making simply couldn't handle the agility of smaller aircraft. If Germany wanted a twin-engine fighter with one engine on each wing, perhaps they should have looked towards the P-38 for inspiration reduce the size a little bit, and reduce the weight, give the plane that increased power the second engine offered while reducing the detrimental effects of doing so as much as possible. They also would learn their lesson a little bit towards the very end of the war with the creation of the Dornier DO-335, a twin-engine heavy fighter that instead used a push-pull engine configuration that gave it the greater maneuverability of a single-engine fighter with the overall power of a heavy fighter. Of course, these planes appeared far too late in the war to have any kind of impact. They might have been a dominant force, but they were simply too late. Overall, though, Germany's seeming obsession with heavy fighters, I think, proved to be a major detriment. As the war progressed, Germany needed single-engine fighters that could match up against Allied single-engine fighters. They needed fighters that on paper were weaker, but in practice were stronger. It seems they went with that paper strength a little too often. Over 1,000 410s were made, and over 6,000 BF 110s were made. It does make you wonder how much things would have changed if they had shifted their focus off of heavy fighters and onto more and more BF-109s and FW-190s. It probably wouldn't have been war-winning, I mean, Hitler was still leading the charge over there, and it's not like he was some kind of tactical genius, but at the very least, it probably would have been a better allocation of their resources. Alright, and with that, we'll go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. You know, with Hitler in charge of Germany, I think the heavy fighter obsession was kind of inevitable. He had this seeming infatuation with bigger super weapon type things, like the Doro railway cannons. The way he viewed military weaponry was not all that ideal or that realistic. But he was their leader, and he assumed supreme command over the military, so what he said is what went. They were kind of screwed on that aspect. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!